there is nothing like um, the feeling of holding that child, that baby, for the first time. We all remember that. We can likely all place ourselves where we were and what we were feeling. You know, the greatest days ever in anyone's life is the day they become a parent and they hold that child. But that was true for the family named Day, the Day family. It was a little more challenging, however, because they lived on the border of New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, back when that was a territory in the 1880s, the Lazy Bee Ranch is what they had carved out of the high desert and the rocks of that area. And for generations, it had been the Day Homestead. Uh, Sandra was a young girl born into that tough environment. Her father was brilliant and had planned a career at Stanford, but his father, Sandra's grandfather, died while she was young, and he was forced to come back home from school and to run the ranch. That meant that Sandra, while born, lived two hours from the nearest school. And so her mother homeschooled her and her brother. They reared her until she, as a high schooler, demonstrated a spectacular intellectual mind, and they sent her off to the best boarding school they could find in that area. She fulfilled dad's dream and went on to Stanford University, where she would study law, study law further on, would end up clerking for one of the Supreme Court justices, and eventually marry a man named Mr. O'Connor, and Sandra Day O'Connor in 1981 would be appointed to the Supreme Court by President Ronald Reagan. And she overcame all kinds of obstacles. She demonstrated not only tremendous intellectual skill, she demonstrated character. After serving on the court for decades, she stepped down a few years ago, and her reason was because her husband was suffering from dementia. She said she would dedicate her remaining years to caring for him. You don't achieve that kind of thing in life, especially having come from a really difficult place, without somebody making deep deposits into your character. In Sandra Day O'Connor's case, that was mom and dad. That's true for you and for me. No one will have a deeper influence on your life, certainly not when we're young, than mom and dad. Moms and dads, you and I have been given by God the lion's share of the responsibility for shaping those precious kids he's entrusted to us. So take a look at the book of Colossians. We're in our 11th week of our series on the book of Colossians. And week after week, we've discovered the power of Jesus Christ to transform, to change, to make new, to give purpose in life. And then a couple of weeks ago, we sort of shifted the focus because uh, chapters 3 and 4 of Colossians, the focus is on relationships. Now here is the theme of the last half of Colossians, just so we're careful to understand what the Lord is saying to us. It's simply this. Jesus Christ has transformed every relationship we have. Jesus Christ has authority over every relationship that we have. That transforming power of God begins to overflow from our lives and our hearts, our very souls, and begins to impact those who are nearest to us. In fact, here's the thing that God calls us to do, and it's a difficult thing to live out our faith in some of the most challenging environments, that is in our home, where they can tell if you're faking it. God calls us, parents, to model, to put on display the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ in that most demanding of environments, the home. And so when we get to Colossians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, there are clear instructions. There are, in verses 20 and 21, a two commands, one to the parent, one to the child. And there are two reasons given. That is, here's why these commands ought to be uh, obeyed, why we ought to order our lives and our relationships by this. So look at chapter 3, verse 20. First, uh, the Bible addresses children. Now what's remarkable about that is it was not uncommon in ancient times to have what they would call family codes. That is, there were lists of rules about how families ought to be ordered. What's so unique about the scriptures as ancient literature is that in this case, God gives us the dignity of addressing every member of the home. Most old family codes dealt with dad. 
as ruler of the home. Dad, do this. Dad, do that. And wives and children were cons- uh, assumed to be property. God doesn't treat us that way. God gives the dignity of being created in his image and the responsibility as men and women, as sons and daughters, do we have the responsibility to respond. We have free moral character. We have the ability to walk in obedience or not. And so the children are addressed first. And uh, children meaning basically doesn't really have an age to it, but more like if you still are under the roof of your mom and dad, then this should apply to you. And so uh, here's the, uh, the family code. Here's how we ought to order the home. First of all, verse 20, children, obey your parents and everything for this uh, pleases the Lord. Children, obey your parents and everything for this literally, is pleasing in the Lord. As you children live out your faith, what that looks like is obedience. Now, I love the, the word obey here is the word for to, to listen under. Meaning, meaning, kids, if you're still in the home under the authority of mom and dad, you ought to be hearing them in such a way that there is a willingness to obey. Uh, children... As moral creatures created in the image of God, you are called upon to live out your faith by living in obedience, to hear under mom and dad. Let me give you some practical reasons why that is always good counsel. First of all, no one knows you better than mom and dad. You think your friends know you better. They don't. You think you have a secret life with your friends or your buddies, your online presence, and you can be who you want to be. Nobody knows you better than mom and dad. And listen, kids, kids, nobody loves you more than mom and dad. Your first boyfriend doesn't. Your first girlfriend doesn't. All of your friends that have all kinds of counsel on how you ought to be treating your parents, they do not love you more than mom and dad. And so the scriptures give out a very clear instruction. Children... Obey your parents. Listen under their authority with a heart that says, I will do that because they know me and they love me and they have my best in mind. Children, obey your parents in everything. Literally, uh, this is pleasing in the Lord. In the realm of your Christian faith, obedience is what pleases the Lord. In that setting, kids, we are called to live in that sense of obedience, knowing that mom and dad love us, they know us, it's pleasing to the Lord, walk in obedience. Listen with a heart that says, I will respond in obedience to mom and to dad. Then there's a, the flip side of that, and it is a address to parents. And what's so, again, remarkable is how it puts the responsibility on the parent for their rearing or their parenting of the children. And here's the counsel. Fathers, now just to be clear, some Bible translations translate this parents. The reason for that is because it's the same word translated children obey your parents in the Lord. And so here, while it primarily has to do with fathers, especially in the uh, New Testament days in the Roman colonies where this book uh, was being written, this book of Colossians was being written, it would have been fathers but it equally applies to mothers. So if you are a, a single father, this is for you to listen to. If you are a single mom, this is for you to listen to. If you are married and so you have a mom and dad in the home, now this is counsel, this is a command for us, fathers, parents. Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged or in order that they not become discouraged. And so the command is don't provoke your children. The reason is because if you do, it's likely that they become discouraged. So provoke is such a great translation. The the, the idea, the word means to goad someone to action and that it's an unhealthy response of action. In other words, parents, there are things you and I could do that bring out a response of rebelliousness or bitterness in our kids. And you and I, as we parent our children are called to not goad them into harmful behavior. Don't don't provoke them 
into foolish attitudes and actions. And, and the reason for that it's given is lest they become, or it's likely if you do that, lest they become uh, uh, discouraged, verse 21. It's an interesting word. It, it's in English, it would be like adding un or non to the beginning of a word. The word means literally spirited. Or um, uh, it, it can be used for, for warm or pursuit. Or maybe this is a word, passionate. And, and, and if parents, if we provoke our children, the danger is it can lead them to be, here it is, unpassionate. That is, without spirit, we can crush their spirit. God has called you as a father, you as a mother, as a parent, to so work with your children that the result of parenting is not a provoking that leads to a brokenness in their spirit. God has given us spirited children. He's given us children, given us children full of life so that they can go do the thing God created them to do. Parents, you and I are not to discourage that. We are not to provoke from them a negative response. Now, that sounds all well and good. What does it really look like? <laughs> In other words, how do I do that, Scott? And so I thought, it's nice to be able to give you a living example. And so I've invited uh, two families from our church to join me in a brief panel discussion as we talk about the question of what it looks like to rear children. So uh, Corey Heather Becker are going to come up here. Corey serves as an elder. Heather's involved in leading a small group in our church. And then Pastor Derek and his wife, Ilona Prail. Uh, Pastor Derek, our children's pastor, but does so much other stuff as well. Ilona involved also in small group. I know you host and doing a lot of stuff in their homes as well. And so they're going to join me for a few minutes here as we talk a little bit about what it means to do this kind of parenting. And in particular, in particular, uh, what I want to be able to do is talk to them a little about, a bit about where they're at in their life. And so uh, the Prails have uh, very young children, and the Becks have middle school, high school children. So why don't we start here, Derek and Alona, will you tell us a little bit about your family right now, where, kind of where you're at in life? Yes, hi. Um, I'm Derek. This is Ilona. And we have two kids, Caleb, who's five, and Briella, who's two. Uh, they're a lot of fun, and they just keep life really interesting at home, and we have a blast together. So. That's it? <laughs> What's Caleb like? Caleb. He's hey, sitting Caleb. over here. Caleb, yeah. you want to come up on the platform with Dad? Come on up here. <laughs> All right, let's go. Kate, what's Caleb love, uh, Pastor Derek? Caleb, what do you love? Fire trucks. Fire <laughs> trucks, love that. Come right by, you want to come up, stay for a few minutes? All right, good. And he also loves uh, worship. Like, he, that uh, Behold Our God song, he's learning yeah. that in school, and he came home yesterday, and we were both practicing that together, like, uh, he had the guitar, I had a little keyboard, and we were trying to sing the song together. It didn't, didn't sound as good as uh, it did this morning here, but, uh, but we had a lot of fun doing that, didn't we, buddy? And how about Briella? What does Briella love? Briella, you want to talk about Briella? Briella is all girl, which is my dream come true. Yeah. She loves princesses, mm. she loves shoes and dresses and dressing up and dancing. So that's oh, that's Briella excellent. That shop. Yep. That's great. So, Corey and Heather Beck here, talk to a little bit about your family and your children. Yeah, uh, we have three children. Our oldest, Allison, is 16, going on 25. We have, uh, oh yeah, she's a junior at Wheat North. And then uh, Kendall is our middle. She is 15 at Wheat North, a freshman. And uh, Ethan is our son, uh, is a seventh grader at Wheaton Christian Grammar School. And is that your bow tie that he's? Uh... I don't. Know. That's his own. That's bow tie. his own. Wow, he's a, he's a very impressive. Yeah. yeah, I love that. That's great. He is rocketing. So two questions. I want to begin, and just you can answer in whatever order you'd like. First question is simply this. As parents, what have you found to be maybe the greatest challenges you faced right now? I know, again, you have younger children, your children are a little older. If you thought through sort of the challenges you faced, what would that look like? I would say for us, uh, just raising young kids, just in the past few years, uh, our life changed, you know, from just being the two of us and, you know, getting to ha do whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted, uh, to now having young kids where there's demands all the time. And uh, especially if they're not in school yet, you know, you're really just, you know, helping them 
with the day to day of, of everything. They have so many needs, you know, and um, so your, your life changes in a, a major way, right? And so you, you have to be careful not to lose sight of the, the goal of parenting and, and like when you have your young kids, not to get lost in like, all right, we gotta focus on their diapers or, or like whatever they need, all the di discipline issues you might start to face when they're toddlers, um, but not lose sight of the goal of parenting and that's that you're raising a, a human being who's you want to love Christ and to come to know the Lord as their savior. And so it's not uh, a baby that you're, or a kid that you're trying to work, it's a, a person that has a soul and you want them to have a God consciousness where they are thinking about God at a really early age so that as soon as they're able to understand it, it's gonna be a natural thing for them to receive Christ in their life. But it's easy to lose sight of your own relationship with God, your own relationship with each other, when you're in the midst of, of parenting in that uh, on the front lines, you know, day to day. So that's been key for us is just keeping our relationship with Christ first and foremost, and then keeping our relationship with each other really strong because parenting really flows out of those two things. Uh, Corey, Heather? I think for us, just with the teenage years, is just combating the, you know, um, busyness and then just also self-centeredness. Um, you know, especially with social media and phones and how that all plays in. Um, I think just finding the, I guess for um, the mother and father to be unified of what their convictions are, especially as it relates to phones and social media and the use of those and just creating um, the right boundaries and, um, you know, balance. I think with as far as busyness, there's a lot of good things to be involved in, but um, just creating balance and you know, it's going to depend, it's going to differ from family to family, but just being confident um, as parents of what your convictions are for your family and um, being okay with saying this is what we right. think is right for our family. So, so you're, with the young children, it's kind of the busyness, the distraction, right? Like dirty diapers don't lend much to romance, right? You got to do that. So, so watch for that. And folk, I love your idea about kind of taking the long view, you're rearing children that you're going to one day release into the bigger, broader world to be, you know, champions for Christ. So focus on that. And then for you, as you, you kind of navigate the teenage years, setting out the right boundaries, being unified together. I'm hearing both of you talk about uh, parents being together on things and, and sort of determining um, to, to prioritize the marriage relationship on, on the social media, on the phone thing. For our kids, uh, when they were freshmen in high school is when we got them their first phones. They weren't very smart back then. I mean the phones, not the kids. The kids were smart. Uh, the, kid, the phones weren't very smart, and so we didn't have as much to worry about. Later, by the time they were juniors, seniors, we did begin to get that. We did the same thing. We had to talk through what are the, you know, what are the rules, what are the house rules. I think one of the you know, biggest knockdown drag outs arguments we had was over like, where do you put the phone at night and you can't have that in your bedroom? I know it's not part of the question we talked about asking, but it's so important, I think. How have you navigated that? I mean, your kid's probably a little young, well, maybe not for phones and social media, but how have you, for other parents of teenagers, I know because I get asked this question a lot, how, what principles, I'm not saying they have to do what you did, but something guided your decisions on that and how you lean in and set some boundaries. What was that conversation like? What would you maybe help them say, here's what we wrestled through? Well, I think it's, you know, again, important to know your child and how they're wired. And um, obviously you want to be as consistent as possible, but maybe it'll even differ a little bit between kids. But um, I think just knowing where their heart is at and then just being confident in, you know, it's okay to say no to certain apps or it's, you know, even if they want to convince you that they're the only one that they know that isn't allowed to do, you know, A, B, and C. Um, just being confident in that and, um, you know, knowing, I, I think too, as you go on, being flexible and seeing something that worked or something that didn't or being willing to um, adjust things as you see um, how things are affecting their life or maybe how they're maturing, maybe they can handle a little more now, so. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that I think we talked about a baseline or found the foundation of God's word is what how we demonstrate to our kids that is what we measure against. It's right. not what the next family is doing or your friend's family is doing. It is what does God's word teach and what is the what is the the, the instruction of the principle that applies to our discipline or the decisions we're making as parents. And as our children have gotten 
older, it's easier to explain those things to them, but that foundation of God's word is what drives our decisions, not what culture says or what your friends are doing. Which is so great because it gives them a center from which to draw whatever happens in culture, wherever their friends are. That's a great word. Thank you, Corey. Uh, let me ask a second question, kind of follow-up question. Um, you've navigated this, you're different places in your parenting and that, and Vicki and I are parents of, you know, they're gone, they're in their 20s and that. Um, what counsel, what advice might you give to parents that are, you know, maybe in your season of parenting? Uh, what would you say to them? Um, you know, I think parenting changes you so much. You are no longer the person that you used to be. Before kids, and for me, the area that changed the most is definitely my prayer life. You know, there's nothing more that I want as a mom than to see my little kids come to know and trust in Jesus and to serve him and to love him and obey him. And that has really propelled me to just sprint to the Lord for my kids. And so that's my biggest encouragement to all parents is to pray. Pray for the big stuff. Pray for the little stuff. Pray in every season and pray for everything. You know, if there's something to be said about seeing a quality in your child that you know God can use in the future. And so pray about that now. Pray that God gets a hold of their hearts in such a mighty way that they'll want nothing more than to surrender their gifts and their talents to the Lord and use those gifts for his kingdom. And if you see a character flaw in your child that you know in the future could steer them away from the Lord, start praying now and pray a lot. You know, if it means waking up in the morning early, do it. If it means praying at night, if it means fasting, if it means asking friends to pray alongside you, do it. And ask God to carve that out of their hearts so it's not a stronghold over them. But as parents, as we intercede on our kids' behalf, we're really opening up the floodgates of heaven into their lives and asking God to move. And he honors that, and he's faithful to that, and he does it. That's great counsel. I'm sure Derek would back me up here. I think uh, for the younger men, start with a godly wife. That makes things a lot yeah, easier. Yeah, uh, that does. You know, Heather and Alona, as you guys could probably hear, set the tone spiritually in, our, in, in both of our families, I'm sure, in the household and what's, what goes on. The, the other thing I'd add is just the authenticity, the authenticity of your own faith uh, is perhaps the single most important thing you can do as a parent. Listen, from, from my perspective, uh, what our kids observe us doing behind closed doors where nobody else is watching, what we say in the car, what, what things I watch, you know, if they see me reading my Bible or not. Those are the things that my son and my daughters observe when they watch Heather and I and have, I think, the greatest impact of us having trust and um, respect from them uh, and, and how we lead them and try to lead them, uh, but as well also their own salvation. I think what, what Derek shared earlier is, I think, the greatest motivator for them is do their parents actually demonstrate what they're teaching us? Uh, and so that's, I think, probably the most important thing I'd say. I think it's great counsel. And Ilona, you mentioned prayer. Uh, I wonder if you take a moment and maybe prayer, uh, pray right now, lead us in prayer. Would you pray over the, the children? Pray for the moms. And then, Corey, would you pray for the children, but also pray for the dads and the families? I, I love that comment about a godly wife. I think we're all better by that. So if you just pray for the men and, and do that. But Ilona, would you start out that time in prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you, and we are so thankful and grateful for the gift of parenting, the fact that you have entrusted us with our children. Lord, we know that they don't belong to us. They are yours. And so, Lord, right now, we just lift up our kids, and we place them at your foot. Lord, we ask that, God, you would intercede on their behalf and that you would do a work in their hearts so that they will desire and long for you, Lord, that they will make a commitment to follow hard after you, Lord, and that they will trust you and obey your word, Father. And God, I also just lift up all the moms. Lord, I know that sometimes we could get so overwhelmed with the demands of being a mom and a wife and all the responsibilities we have. Lord, would you remind us to turn to you? Mm -hmm. Would you remind us to lean into you, Father, in those times where we are overwhelmed? Lord, may we fix our eyes on you. Lord, may your spirit renew us, Father. And may you draw us close to yourself. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I agree with that, Father God. I also pray that you continue to grow up the children in this church, Father God. We are so blessed at Crossroads to have such a wide expanse of children from all ages here. That's, just, that's from you. So we pray, Lord, as a congregation that we come alongside these children, that you would use us as parents, as singles, um, to, to grow them up, to, uh, to demonstrate what, it, what godliness looks like in their lives. But thank you, Father God, so much that, you, that you've given us children. We know that that was at your heart, Father God, so often is to, uh, to care for the children in this church. And, um, so thank you for that. We also pray, Lord, I pray for the men of this church, pray for the fathers, that they would lead well, 
uh, Father God, that they would have, be motivated in their homes, in their families, to demonstrate what it means to lead well with their mouths, with their actions, uh, and also in how they love, uh, Father God. So teach and lead the men of our church to be uh, good husbands, good fathers, not only to their children, but to their wives. And that through that, Lord, uh, you would bless. You would bless the families of Crossroads. Thanks for the time this morning, for uh, your patience and grace with all of us as parents and leaders. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. just give you a couple of, um, I got to thank you, a couple of closing thoughts here We wrap up our time together. Three um, takeaways. I want to make sure that there's something you have to walk out of here with. There's some clarity on what it is precisely the uh, scriptures are teaching about rearing children. So uh, really three things that I think will help us in the day-to-day -day battles of parenting. It's easy to get lost in the the diapers and the school and the homework. I am just convinced I went through high school three additional times while our kids were in high school. And so uh, three things I would say to you. First of all is this, remember the goal. Remember the goal. Pastor Derek said such, a, uh, said such a great thing about that a few moments ago. You're not just raising babies. You are rearing the next generation of Christian influencers. Don't lose sight of that as you're changing diapers, feeding teaching kids over and over again. It's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get flustered. It's easy to be able to lose sight of that. You are making a difference generationally. Do not lose sight of that. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, one of the best and perhaps one of the most misunderstood verses about parenting says this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so often you've heard that taught as, well, get a kid to Sunday school, teach him moral instructions, get him to the Awana Children's Ministry, teach him to do good, maybe you send him to Christian school for a stretch, and then when he's old, he'll be good. And if he does go haywire off the bandwagon, lose the reservation, you can count on the fact that he'll come back, because, well, that's what the Bible says. That's a great thing to believe, it's just not what this verse is teaching. <laughs> What this verse is teaching is very clear, and it's the primary thing you and I as parents are charged to do. Train up a child literally according to his way. In the way he should go is not talking about moral training, although that is certainly something you and I must do. What this proverb is teaching is dad, mom, Know your child well enough to understand what is his way. Your child is not a blank slate. He and or she was born with specific interests and talents and abilities and drives, and they're like a shopping cart with a bad wheel. They keep going their way. Good. Our job as parents is to train them according to the way. Now, the word train is a very picturesque word. It's uh, used of bits in horses' mouths, and so it helps them direct their path. It's also used of in the nursery when a uh, nurse would dip her finger, it's an old tradition, in something bitter or tart. Uh, it was often crushed dates in those days. Today we might use lemon juice. And you just kind of swab the mouth, and what does that baby's mouth do? And, and, and right away it begins to initiate the sucking reflex and they begin to be hungry and recognize, oh, there's something I'm supposed to do. You and I as parents are called to help our kids discover and pursue those things for which God has created them. Give you a perfect, what's that look like in real life? So we have three children and we have pictures. And so we have Nate as a 10 year old standing behind a pulpit pretending to preach. That kid was made for the pulpit. He's pastoring down in the Indianapolis area now. He's doing what he loves. We have pictures of our son Isaiah. That kid would play anything within reach when it came to music. He played the pots and the pans on the kitchen floor. We got a piano. He was at that piano bench all the time. We didn't have to make him go to piano lessons. He's ready to go to piano lessons. He loves being involved in music. That's his way. Our daughter Brooke, 26 years old. And she, it looks like a bomb went off in her bathroom. 
there is all kinds of stuff I don't understand all over the, the walls and on the floor. And, on, and she's a top salesperson for her company in all of Chicago, right? Why? She was born to sell things to people. She's great at that. One of the things Vicki and I had to do when our children were young was to understand and know our children well enough so we could help train them according to their way. Moms, dads, remember the purpose. Never forget why God placed those children into your care. You're to know, to learn, and to direct them according to their way so that when they're older, they don't depart from it. They're doing what they love, and they are grateful for mom and dad for that. Second, remember the goal. Secondly, don't parent in fear. Don't parent in fear. We live in such a day full of fear where you can listen to a podcast, you can read a book, you can go to a seminar, you can hear your pastor preach it, and sometimes the net effect of that is to say, I don't measure up. (laughs) I'm afraid I'm going to do something wrong. Will you hear what I'm saying to you? Listen to me. You are not going to ruin your child. I mean, unless you are intentionally setting out to do harm, our kids are resilient. God placed them into your home and your care because you are the person that will do the most good for them. Will you stop being afraid of your role as a parent? God has given them to us. Parent them and do not parent them in fear. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the clearest example of that. Verse 4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Here's the command. God is one. He's revealing who he is. And what we are to do in response to that is to love him with all that we have and all that we are. And then you know what verse 7 says? Teach these things to your children. Talk about it when you get up and when you go to bed, as you walk along the way, as you go to work, as you're at table around the home. What, what, what is it? What am I supposed to talk about? Well, let me just give you three reasons the scriptures give right in the same paragraph. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules the Lord has given us? You shall say to him, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Don't ever be afraid to say, listen, God has transformed me. And Jesus Christ, my Savior, gave me the responsibility to rear you, and I will do that without backing down because I love you and I know you. Or how about this? And he brought us, that is, God brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give us, a good land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, this is the best way to live. You and I as parents need not live in fear because what we're calling them to is the very best life that God could possibly offer to them. Third, and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always. The end of the day, the answer is why, son? Why, daughter? Because it's the best. Because this is for our good. Because I, as a parent, will never forget that what God has called me to do is to know you and train you and equip you to do that thing that God has created you and called you to do in life. Don't parent in fear. Third, never give up. Just never give up. When they're little and you're fatigued, push through. When they're teenagers, you don't know what to do, figure it out, but don't give up on them. When they're out of the home and they're not near you, pray for them. Do not give up on them. Let me answer a question that some may have. What do you do with a prodigal? That is someone who's broken your heart, someone who's who's left the way of following the Lord. First thing I would do is turn them over to the Lord. 
Just as Ilona mentioned in her talk about prayer, listen, you realize as tough as, as it is to control a three-year-old, there is very little hope to control a 23 or a 33 or a 53-year-old. So I turn them over to the creator of the universe who alone can transform the heart. And I go after them in prayer very specifically. I would turn them over to God in prayer. Secondly, I would maintain the relationship. Yeah, but you don't understand. They're not living according to my standards. No, I understand that. That's why they're a prodigal. But remember, you maintain that relationship. Thank God he came after us when we were going astray. Shouldn't we do that for our very sons and daughters that God has entrusted to our care? I, by the way, I'm not talking about enabling bad behavior. I'm talking about doing what you can to maintain the relationship. Yes, invite them to Christmas at your house. And yes, invite their wayward friends too. No, you're not endorsing their life. You're maintaining a relationship. Yes, go to their house. Do what you can to continue to shine the light, uh, shine the light of the gospel. You are sanctifying them by maintaining their relationship. I'm not saying come off of your convictions. I'm saying maintain the loving relationship just like God always, always pursues us. Three, welcome back the repentant. And my emphasis there is on the descriptor, the repentant. I love the prodigal son, and when that son came to his senses, I love that turn of phrase Jesus used. When he came to his senses and realized how good things were at home, he turned and he came back, and the father welcomed him back. You, you will know, you will know, parent, when that repentance happens. When there's a humility, there's an embrace, there's a, a, an acknowledgement, a willingness to acknowledge the truth of their own life choices. You say, well, you know, we've kind of been on a roller coaster where they kind of repent and they go back and they repent and they go back. What do we do about that? What did Jesus say about forgiving somebody? How many times? 70 times 7? I guess what I'm saying to you, parent of a prodigal, prepare to have your heart broken, but don't close up your heart. When that transformation of the gospel takes root in their heart and when there is repentance and that repentance leads them to a life that is lived under the authority of God, maybe that's time to throw a party and celebrate. That's the example Jesus gave for us, right? It was uh, Friday morning when uh, one of our elders, Joe Loss, his father died. Uh, Ed Loss was 92. I baptized Ed about 20 years ago or so. And I gathered Friday night with the family. We planned out the funeral service, which is here this uh, Monday and Tuesday. And uh, there I was looking around the table. You know, a lot of conversation, about 30 people in the home. And uh, here's a, uh, Ed has children in their 50s and their 60s and in their 70s. Think about that, children in their 70s with mom and dad still living. And I looked around the table, you know, sometimes they're talking about order of service and and, and I listened to the stories they began to tell. And I listened to someone, one of their kids, over 70 years of age, get quiet, get choked up, talking about what dad has meant to her. Over 70 years of age, and dad can still get her choked up. Parents, don't you ever give up. Your influence will go on into your 70s and 80s, and if God gives it to you, 90s, and after you're gone, it's worth it. God called you to that. With joy and courage, do what God has called us as parents to do. Father, I thank you for uh, the practicality of your word. I pray that you would help us, imperfect human beings that we are, to do our best to rear these children you've given us. Father, there are no perfect parents. Yes, we all make mistakes. Of course, we all fall short. And yet, God, you give us the privilege of leading the next generation to faith, to shape them, to make a difference in the world. God, I pray for parents who have wayward sons and daughters that you would give them great grace and strength, a renewed hope that their Influence will make a difference. Father, I pray for parents who have younger children that they would fight the good fight. They would not give in to peer pressure or fatigue. 
Father, I pray for children who are fighting mom and dad, even now that they would live in obedience to mom and dad, to listen under their authority and do. And God, I pray this would be a church where families could feel at home, where the grace of the gospel is made clear, where brokenness is restored. And we are equipping another generation of men and women to serve you. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the power of the gospel may be in evidence this week as often we'll gather with our family. May be a time of rejoicing, we pray. And I ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people agreed by saying.